attending virtually, if you have any questions at the end of the presentation, please email me at tbarksdale at prairiedunes.com. And the reason why we were all here is in 2022, we had another town hall meeting. It was the last time we did this. And we had a group called GGA in that came in and did an audit of the club and, and recommended some medium-term capital projects, one of which is a pump house and new irrigation pump. So uh, those were recommended for 2023 or 2024, kind of after we finished our irrigation system. So here we are, and uh, it's time to make some meaningful upgrades to the club infrastructure, and I'm gonna hand it over to Corey to talk about the pond now. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Corey Grayson, the superintendent out here. Uh, been here since 2014, did a two year stint at Valley Neal, so good to be back. And I kind of just want to give you a rundown of what the club's history is and what we've dealt with infrastructure wise for the pond and pump station. Um, so it's it's kind of unique. We found this clip in the Hutch, Hutch newspaper archives, uh, kind of showcasing that our current reservoir pond that we have predates the club, or was built the same year as the club, around that time in 38. Uh, it was built to 750,000 gallons holding capacity. That was with the intent for a nine hole, single row irrigation system. So over the years, um, they have made it bigger. Doug Peterson in the 80s, and then Stan George in the 90s and early 2000s um, have made it bigger to roughly two and a half billion gallons to what it is today. Uh, Stan, that we know of, uh, we have pictures and some various things that show he's, he's tried dredging twice for expansion and cleanup and things like that. Um, for those who don't know what dredging is, that's basically you drain the pond, you dig it out as best you can to get rid of silts and sands that have blown in. So that was done in the 80s and then again, <clears throat> to my understanding from uh, from past employees and Jim Campbell. It was done uh, early 2000 to late 90s. So it was only, you could only do so much um, with equipment then. So it just, it was never really, you, you couldn't clean out as best as you could. Um, and, and here we are. We could not make it any bigger, just kind of what it was being landlocked to along, 17, or along 11 Fairway. Um, and here again, just another picture of one of the cleaning processes. And kind of, a, again, a rough or a comparison of what we're dealing with now and what we're looking at in a proposed project. Our current pond is a flood intake. It's very old school technology. It's where you take the pond and the head pressure of the pond is above the pump station and then that allows water movement into the pump station to pressurize the system. It does not allow you to pump out the whole pond. It's only about 70% of what the pond is water-wise is what you can actually get out of the pond. The 30% that stays there just to actually move water into the pump station. So obviously old tech, it's gotten us by, it works. Um, but here we are, you know, it's, it's 2024 and there's, you know, there's different technologies there. Um, as well as our intake pipe that goes into the pump station, it's a 10 inch, um, limits us to 1,300 gallons a minute, not very much. Um, when you're talking about 
running up to 700 to 800,000 gallons a night during peak season. So, <clears throat> this was a picture taken this year. Uh, we did have issues with our pump station. We lost one of the three pumps, and we had a dive team come in to check for any kind of disruptions in the pump in, or the pipe intake, as well as silt sands. You know, troubleshooting is, is all we were doing here. Um, and as you can tell, the diver is literally standing um, at the foot of the concrete grate, which is, so he would be standing right there. So that tells you what our depth is during peak season. Um, and again, it's just not, we, you know, we're, we're at that threshold of barely getting by. And again, I'm gonna use that term a lot, is getting by. Um, is where we've been, so 12 foot deep at depth, where we can get as high as we can get. Um, we use mechanical and chemical practices to try and control the algae. It doesn't always work. It works for so long. Um, and we do what we can through the summer. Um, here, this is when they took apart the intake. <clears throat> as you can see, there's sludge buildup and grime that goes into the intake. We have no strainers, filters, or waste strainers to pump out any excess silt sands get sucked in. Um, so the pumps just are at the mercy of what, what allows it to flow through. And 11-year-old uh, pumps that are currently failing, which, which happens, you know, that's kind of a replacement plan that you put into place is, you know, you, you're talking anywhere from 15 to 20 year pump replacement. Well, we're at 11, we've already lost one. So that's, that showed us signs of extreme wear and tear that we shouldn't be having. Uh, we talked to our irrigation architect, Brian Kagan. He kind of did an assessment um, internally and, and felt that, yeah, this is not, this is not the norm, so. And it kind of, it, it made us ask questions like, are we doing everything we can? Is this the right approach? Is this where we need to be with our current pond, um, as well as the pond station? <coughs> This is, this is an overhead view of the proposed pond. Um, some of those, some were asking, where is this located? As you can see, this is the existing pond, just right off of 11. So 11 fairway runs just right here off the right side of it. And then this would be the tree row and sand dune that follows adjacent to 11, left of 11. Current uh, turf care center right here, our shop. <clears throat> there is an existing pond right here that Stan built 2012, I believe. So basically all we're doing is expanding that pond. Um, as you can tell, this is much larger uh, than even a portion of that on 11. It's proposed at two and a half acres, and our current one is one and a half acre size. So two and a half acre surface area. As well as, there's at least, um, six aeration units for moving water, and then we, we, we call them burper valves, which kind of I'll dive in a little bit more about liners and how that works, so. But again, state of the art, everything we can throw at it. <clears throat> Depth was another big thing with our new pond. Since our current pond's at 12 feet max that we can get it, we looked at, can we go deeper? Is it efficient? Um, as well as cost efficiency too. But the main goal was, to have the cleanest, coolest water in the peak season. That's why we, we went as deep as we did. Uh, 25 feet deep is the operating depth. And then it'll roughly sit around 20 is as deep as it'll go with a 30 foot wet well. Um, and again, that's for coolness in the summertime as well as clean. The deeper it is, the less sunlight penetrates through the body of water, eliminating less potential for algae and moss and all those kinds of biological uh, build up. Uh, as well as the air filtration that we're going to be pushing in to keep moving water, um, that will greatly help it too. And, and I'm going to dive into the, again we talked about flood intake on the old pond. <clears throat> again, old technology, newer technology, it's basically just a well, like your well in your yard, um, used for irrigation. What we do is, it's an intake pipe that will flow through the ground that will be installed. There'll be a filter here, stainless steel filter for, for large particles. And as it flows into the wet well, it's a concrete wet well, and that'll basically pump 
pump any water you want out of the pond through that inlet pipe. So basically you're creating a well, an irrigation well. Um, 30 foot deep, and then these pumps, uh, there's three of them at 70 horsepower compared to our 60 horsepower. So again, more efficient, um, bigger pumps, which always helps. Another thing too, <coughs> with, with the um, vertical lift pumps is efficiency and time. And so that, that means it's basically less utilities as well as, um, as well as bigger pumps, so less time to run the irrigation at night. And that was another huge factor for us for playability. We want to run the pumps as least as we can, because that means the water gets out on the golf course quicker and allows the plant and the course to dry down for the rest of the night. That leads into playability, firmer playing surfaces in the morning, and healthier turf, less fungicides. Because if you water all night, what does that do to your lawns, right? You don't want to water your lawn all night because all you're doing is just creating fungal pressures. So that, it's the same with the golf course. We, that's what we strive for, which is why we wanted to go with a larger pump station than what we currently have. <coughs> kind of diving into the infrastructure of the pond, uh, again, a 30, 30 inch intake pipe compared to our 10 inch, which will allow anywhere from probably 2,000 to 2,200 gallons per minute with the new pumps compared to the 1,300 gallons per minute with our current system. Um, that should shave our peak irrigation time from 12 hours from anywhere from 6 to 8 hours. So it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, hearing those numbers, Coming, you know, that I heard that from our designer, that, that was huge. I mean, uh, it's, it's imperative that, that we focus on those numbers. Um, as well, all, everything we do in here is non-corrosive, either it's a polyethylene pipe that we use on our irrigation system or it's all stainless steel. Um, and then as well as the liner that will go on the pond, that will be installed and rolled out and then fused together just like our piping. That's a 60 mil. It's above industry standards for ponds in the, in the golf industry. Um, our contractor said 60 mil will be better, and it's economically, it's, it's almost just the same, so, um, that, which was huge. Um, another thing our contractor showcased us was armor form, which, is, which was another uh, huge positive, because we were looking at doing a concrete shoreline, which is a lot of cost to take initially, um, armor form is a fabric that you roll down off of the edges of the pond and it rolls into the pond just like you see it. That's just a woven fabric that's meshed together and then you pump a concrete grout into certain access points and it fills that fabric up and then it, it locks in as concrete. So basically you're taking away that concrete shoreline that you have to hand pour and form and you can use this fabric and it lasts just as long. And we actually get more protection going down the slopes. So. And all that does is increase our lifespan of our liner, which our liner's almost, I mean, it's the second most important thing other than the pumps. Our liner's gonna keep our water where it needs to be, and it's gonna keep any silt and sands from coming up out of that clay layer to contaminate the pond. So um, there's dredging machines that we can use to suck any silts and sands that blow in and settle at the bottom. And that could be a 15 to 20 year cycle that we do um, to keep it as clean as Here's another picture of one of the, air, the aeration systems. There's gonna be six of those, they're probably about three foot wide. They'll be portioned around the pond. Um, I do wanna to note too that Rick McGuire, all, all of our contractors and, and designers we use, you know, we, we look for the best. Um, and Rick McGuire is a pond designer at, from California, moved to Texas, um, 30 year history of doing waterworks, ponds, Barrancas in California, um, all kinds of types of water erosion and water only facilities. Um, has done LACC, Bel Air Country Club, his Casa Pines in his recent, his Cabot. Um, more than happy he drove up here within three days, wanted to see the site. Great guy to work with. Um, and Barnum, uh, one of the best at doing what he does. Um, and then again, Brian Kagan, our irrigation architect that we hired out of Colorado, not only a designer, but a consultant for water savings um, 
and water regulated. He does a lot in Colorado. Um, and that's why we chose him for the irrigation system, and I wanted him to work on our pump station design too. And all these components and factors and designers focus on what, what can we do for water savings for prairie dunes, not only now, but for the future, and what future regulations we may come into down the road. Um, but again, the new pump station, 375 horse pumps um, to get us set 2,000 gallons a minute um, during peak use. And then an additional 20 horse and a five horse pump to save on run time when we're not in peak use for wash bay reasons, uh, hand water and things like that. So um, the, new, the new pumps will have micron filters and waste drainers that are automated um, and can be replaced for cleaning and things like that. So again, just it's all those checks that we need to put in place so we can have the cleanest, best water for the irrigation use. Um, I do get questions like, why do we need all these components and factors? And when you're looking at a multi-million dollar irrigation system, and I'm talking about a new pond and pump station, these are all things that over time, when you run sand through components, that, that wears out quicker than just silts. Sand will destroy a pump station quicker than you think, which, and that's what we're seeing right now with our current system. So again, that's why we go through all these checks to have all the micron filters, the waste strainers, everything automated and, and easily easily cleanable so that we can you know, continue that longevity of our equipment. So. Um, kind of a brief timeline. We're looking at approximately 16 weeks. Kind of a goal is to say if we can get done before peak summer season. You know, it's, it's full, it's operating. We've now phased out of the old pond and pump station by summertime, that, that's our goal. So here's kind of a breakdown. These things can overlap um, as far as the procedure, but that's kind of the, the, the rundown of, of how we'll go about filling the pond, setting the pump station um, in there for us. So. <coughs> and with that, I won't dive into this for me just yet. Uh, I think one, one more thing to highlight before you talk about the surface acres of the pond. Um, the new pond is estimated to hold 9 million gallons of water. Yes. Um, functionally, right now, with 70% of our current pond is probably about 1.6 million gallons. We're, we're going about five times bigger than the new one. How will you fill it? How will we fill it? Yeah. The same way we do with the current one. The current, just run off. No, we have, we have wells. We have well yeah, we have ten. Well, we have ten irrigation wells mm -hmm. around the property that we use to currently fill. Are your wells so unlimited on gallons? No, we, okay. we, we abide by all rules I mean, just like everybody lot. else. Um, that's a lot of water that you've got to figure out. Yeah, it's you a know. it's a large initial fill. Okay. Which will take time. We've done the math. It'll mm -hmm. take a month, but we don't have to. We can operate at half. So as it fills, we will still we will still be operating. And we will use the old pond and to supplement irrigation as the new one fills. So all of our wells, they're around the new and old pond, and we can we can Y off our feeding pipe to run the boat. Okay. So. Yep. So what um, conversations has management had with the city? As a, a city council today had a meeting on the fire, and obviously all of us are, are concerned with the wildfires came down the Hayward Road. But how could this project help build a fire berm or prevent fire from coming over into the flight loss area? So the pond won't really help anything because obviously that's irrigation and it's, it's isolated. But what we do, and I don't want to get off topic, but what we do is we, I mean, you've probably seen the pasture over here. It's getting mowed currently right now, just off of five. We do that every year and we do fire prevention around the whole property. So. Obviously, we're limited to our property, but we do everything we can to prevent any fires from either going through prairie dunes or leaving prairie dunes. Will the pond expand where you do fire prevention? I mean, will you go farther that way? Yeah, so, yeah, well, the pond will does creep north, further north than the, than the current one, so they're technically, yeah, it'll be taking away some of the fire prevention, but yeah, as well as, you know, we'll do more mowing around the pond as well. 
Yeah, and we can, I can more than happy to answer more questions when we're all done too, so. Yeah. Yeah, so Bill has talked, Bill been on the Greens Committee for a long time, and he knows our ins and outs of what we do um, as far as catching water on the course, and uh, not on the, on the course, but on the property itself. Um, Stan started this, you know, so it's been going on for 20, 20 plus years, um, and we've, we've really upgraded our, our collection areas on the course, and to pump off at least 95% of rainwater that hits the property or the golf course itself, we can pump it back to our irrigation ponds. And now with the new system, we're looking at pumping it to an area, letting it settle, so we get all those sands and silts and, and everything out of, out of that area, and then we can pump it into the new pond. So everything will tie in together um, accordingly. And part of the irrigation project that we did this year was, was not only irrigation, but those piping areas means to update it so that we can allow rainwater to be brought back more efficiently um, than, than what it used to be. So, this is a good thing. Hey, Corey, if, if you have a pump failure in the future with the new pond like you have this summer, how, how would it be better than the new pond that you faced this summer? So what, what we faced this year with this flood, or the flood intake was, it, it was a two month lead time on a pump and then a month lead time on the propeller because it's that flood intake. So with the new system, having 375 4s vertical lift pumps, those are more readily available. You know, uh, cities use them, ag uses them, industrial uses them. So those are more readily available. That we Then we'll bring in a crane or a small crane. They take the top off of the roof of the pump house and they basically just pull that pump out and then set it aside and we pull the new one in and set it in. So and again, having the three 75 force pumps, that's just going to give us more volume to push in case one of them does go down. So, and again, a vertical lift uh, is more efficient and lasts longer, so that that was greatly improved. You know, uh, the flood intakes are horizontal, so they actually over time can they get stresses almost from just being on a horizontal plane. So, but yeah, I mean, to answer your question, Brandon, it, there is. The vertical lifts are more readily available. So, anything else? Again, I'm more than happy to answer questions when we're all done, too, if anything wants to pull me aside. So. Uh, this is the proposed short game uh, area, and it's currently right now to the north of where the lodges are. It's called the Lodge Pond. Uh, Dave Axum did a great job of, of laying this out. From this green to the east green is about 100 yards. Uh, and if you picture it, it's, it's a pond now. We'll, we'll fill some of it up, but it would kind of be a little bit of a, of a sunken down area with all the targets would be uh, a little bit elevated, have a bunker to kind of frame it. What this would really give you a chance to do is practice kind of the shots that you hit on the golf course. <clears throat> right now, if you want to hit those shots, you go up to the range. We have a couple of nets set out there. Not, not a great um, challenge of what you get out on the course, but um, having this be 100 yards, that I think what he did setting this up, the beauty of it is we could get a lot of people out there. Benefits would be junior golf. We could get, we could put all the kids over there and even almost make like a course, um, you know, have a three-hole course, take them from over there to the putting green so everything's uh, kind of centrally located there. Also, clinics, um, camps, things like that. So the, the benefits of being able to practice the shots basically that you would hit on the course compared to what we have. similar to what we have on the course. So I think it would be for like major tournaments coming up, Big 12, Senior Open, those guys would absolutely love that area. Um, 
people would be out there watching that. It would be a really one you know, to be able to better. See the yeah. Here, here is the back road. Um, another question I have was parking. Um, there, there is potential for like car parking and things like that in this area. Um, and again, like, because Thomas, John, and I were in a meeting with Dave Axel on this. Um, this is a concept rendering. It's not exactly the the design you're going to see. Um, the bunkers. <coughs> You know, position for to emulate shots that Prairie Dunes, you know, creates. So, and, and Dave knows those better than anybody. Um, again, this is just a conceptual rendering. So, don't. Uh, I some people are worried that there's a bunker in front of every green. Like, obviously, that's not going to be. It's just. Is that part of what's going to happen there? That is. This is the pond. That is. The pond. Yeah. So okay. excavation dirt from the irrigation pond will be brought over uh -huh. um, and filled the pond in for to, to move forward, well, to be built on top of it, so. So will that water then have to go somewhere else? Yeah, we'll pump that into the irrigation pond. It's honestly, that pond doesn't even hold a half acre foot, so it's only about four or five foot deep. Okay. Um, it was built just to move water quickly off the golf course in the 90s, so early 2000s. Yeah, I mean, everyone will just kind of have to be aware of where everyone is. Um, you know, it's it, it's pretty big out there as far as, you know, getting enough people across, especially. Just have to be careful not to put the fire over top of anyone or to the right of them. Something to keep in mind, too, is it is an acre and a half size. I mean, if you can picture an acre and a half, but I'm sure everyone's seen the putting green we just built out here. That's only 20,000 square feet. That's not even a half acre. So this will be an acre and a half. So just kind of. So you can use any one of those greens and probably not interfere with anybody else. Yeah, talking with Dave, the greens will probably be almost 3,000 square feet, or if not more. I mean, in Prairie Dunes right now, we're running around 4,000 square feet grains on the course. Mm -hmm. So th they're going to be a lot larger than what you would picture a target green. Uh, as you can see, you put double flags on each, something we could do there too. So. We're right now on the north, on the west side there. You know, above the water right now, that walking path is like, like six feet above. Yeah, you're talking about this? Yeah. Yeah. How is this going to lay it in? That will stay there. So it's kind of like a buffer. Really. Yep, that buffer will stay there. That that road will not move. The main line currently runs through it. So, yep. So, yeah. Um, thanks, John. <coughs> Construction timeline on this. Uh, we put Dave put this together with us um, to kind of work into his schedule and, and kind of work into ours. Obviously, this is this is a major project. It's not just something we can crank out in a month. Uh, this takes some time, some shaping, and some thought. When you're kind of what Dave said was when you're building something like this, it takes some creativity because it's from scratch, right? It's not it's not we go discover a golf hole out there in the past, you know, out there in, in the native. It's 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 built from scratch. He's taking into effect um, the rolls, the elevation changes in the greens that Perry did out here. Um, you know, the bunker sizes, the bunker depths that you'll see out, out on the course too. So that takes time. Um, so the first stage, obviously, fill in the pond with the excavated uh, material from the irrigation pond, which is a huge savings. Um, next, Dave comes in and starts rough grading. Early summer, mid-summer, finished grade. Um, not final grade, but what we call finished grade. And then that's when landscapes unlimited who did our irrigation project. I'm, I'm, I was blown away, you know, I had high expectations of landscapes, but they, they delivered. On my end, I hope, I hope that you all feel the same way. So we will be using Landscapes Unlimited again for the irrigation and the drainage portion um, required on the project. And 
and then fall, you know, we plan to do uh, seeding the greens, the three greens, do a growing just like we did this large putting green, and then do a bluegrass fairway um, sod install either late fall or early spring of, of 25. So all this will kind of, the bulk of this will be done this year with hopes of being a grand opening in the spring of 25. So, but yeah. Um, questions on that? Otherwise, I'll take it away or give it to them. I'm sorry, yeah, thanks, Tom. So, the cost to upkeep it is another big component. What, what's it going to cost? Can, can my team handle it? Um, but fortunately, or fortunately, I was at Bally Neal. Uh, at Bally Neal, we have six acres of bent grass greens we took care of, 18 holes and a par three with, that was 12 holes. So, I have experience in running more than just 18. I knew what it takes. I dove back into calling Jared, my old boss, and saying, hey, let's help me with this. Let's look at the ins and outs. How can we manage this without just saying, I need, I need new staff, I need new equipment, I need new everything. Again, it's an acre and a half. Um, and that rolled into this number, um, just right around 10,000. No need for more mowers, no need for more crew. There's ways that we imp implement that short game area into what we do. The up cost is obviously just chemical fertilizer seed and then a little bit of labor and fuel, obviously, to run the equipment. So, again, annual $10,000 to upkeep this piece of property. So. All right, so what does everything cost? <coughs> we have our annual meeting ballot coming up. So, bids on the project came in at just under $1.6 million. Uh, just over a million two on the irrigation pond, 340,000 on the short game area. So why do we combine these two together? So we started looking at future needs for the club. Um, we lost the short game area right here when we built the building that we're sitting in. Um, obviously that's a, we're a golf club at our core. So that's a really, really big need for our membership. We've got future events. We've got growing junior programs. We've got uh, members that come out and support the club. I think everybody would like to hit a few wedges, a few bunker shots, um, and have a really, really nice area to do that in. Um, and we started looking at, we're getting ready to move a lot of dirt, and we need to stash it somewhere. And if we're going to use it in the future, what's the trucking cost difference? Um, and we feel like, like doing these projects together, the low-end savings on trucking alone is about $50,000 in the short-term area. So through our budget meetings this fall, we thought, the club's in great financial health, why not try and combine these two together? So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, how are we going to pay for it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Looks like I get to talk about the money. Thanks, Keith. <laughs> Look, uh, Dale Snell, and most of you know me, I think. So, yeah, I think what we've covered so far from my perspective is the the experts that actually know about irrigation and ponds are telling us unequivocally you really need this new pond. I think um, it's probably Ryan said your horse and your irrigation system are a Ferrari and you have a Kia engine in that Ferrari right now. And so we kicked around, do we, do we need to do that? Board determined we do. And then secondly, we've got some big events coming up in the future and the idea of not being able to hit a 30 yard pitch for those players is not tenable, we don't think, for our club. That would be a bad look. And then, like Thomas talked about, combining them makes a lot of economic sense and it's good timing, I think. And so then the last hurdle is, that's all great. If we can't afford it, we still can't do it. So I guess my role is to assure everyone, reassure everybody, it's really not close. We can easily afford to do this. Um, most clubs of our size around the country have 2.7 times revenue as their debt load, and we have 0.9 or something like that. So we don't want to be like those clubs. We want to be more conservative financially and a lot better in a lot of ways. But we have a lot of way, a lot of room to go before we have a debt problem, in my opinion. Um, I think what's changed since last time I talked about debt financing is rates have gone up a lot, and so our bankers are being much more mean to us right now than they might have been in the past um, for good reason. 
So we're, we're thinking a little more creatively with the debt financing, and we don't have it figured out yet, so I don't want anyone to take this as a, you know, this is what's gonna happen, but one option we're strongly considering is debentures for the membership. We've done that in the past. They worked really well, and we don't really think we have any problem uh, filling up the debt load with debentures and getting the members pay back the interest instead of the bank. So that's kind of all I know for sure right now. Uh, we can definitely afford it, and if you're skeptical of that, I think I can convince you to just corner me, okay? Uh, I think the other thing there yeah. is, in, in the ballot, the board's asking permission to borrow up to $1.6 million. We don't actually expect to need all that money. I think the, the current thing you look at, club cash, and and what, what we think our business is going to be in the future is we think we're going to need more like a million dollars. Um, but if we ask for a million, if we need 1.1, that would we'll require another member vote. And the mechanics of that just don't really work well. It requires a 20 day notice, a formal vote. Um, you have to listen to Thomas again. You have to listen to me again. Um, so I think knowing that, hey, let's just approve the entire project. Let's know where we're really looking at borrowing probably 60% of that. Um, and we have some really, really great upgrades to our infrastructure and another really needed member amenity that we lost the last few years to make another amenity happen. Um, after that, we just got questions and answers. So uh, anybody that's, that's tuning in virtually, please email me at tbarksdale at prairiedunes.com. Uh, we'll try and get these answers. Anybody in the, in the crowd, just raise your hand. And um, if we haven't answered it already, happy to discuss it in more detail. Dale, if you uh, look at this uh, and we get that sort of thing, how much time are we talking about we start to have it paid off? And then the second question is, is how many years do we have left on the current plans like this here to make it all be paid off? Are we five years out? Are we three years out? So, I mean, I'm optimistic. Yeah. Most of you know that already. I, I don't think there's... I think it's pretty likely we can get all of our debt paid off in five, six, seven years, including this and all the other debt. I, the reason I don't really like to say that is because is that really smart? Is it likely that that's gonna be the right decision? And I would say no. So it's definitely not a promise that we won't have debt in five or six years, but I certainly think we can turn it over and keep the debt that's advantageous to us and get rid of the stuff we don't want. Now, the first two will have to pay for it, no one. The first law is that it's gone. Yeah. John, just to add to that, so our uh, people that are running right now will allow us to service the debt and confirm this in five years. The question then is, do you have the cash tax? So, you know, that's going to keep the need on other people, depending on what else we have to do. But the biggest part of spend has taken place with this facility, which is very pleasing
So that a member of her name can hit a bunker shot in 2024. Uh, I don't think any of you are going to be very happy if you can't. So um, in conjunction this, with it, he's going to kind of rework the surrounds of the of the, the green that's right next to the driving range. He's going to fit in a little bunker. Um, he's going to create a closely mown area. He's going to kind of create some rough areas. Um, and that, that's going to be in addition to, and that's going to be more of a warm up, hey, I'm getting ready to go play. Hit some balls on the range. I need to hit a couple chip shots before I go, go out on the golf course. That's not going to be a very big area, but it's going to get us through until 2025 and back to And make I think everybody feel a lot better. And then for the future, obviously that's going to be a little bit of a destination. If I still am just looking for that warm up area, we're still going to have it. So, or we expect that. Yeah. Yeah. So we should have that for prime season this year. And that's a that's a very minimal expense. Um, that's just gonna fit the operating budget. Well, guys personally I'm I'm very excited about these. I think they're gonna do you know wonders for the club and um, as much money as we've spent in the last couple of years and the upgrades. This is just kind of one more thing that's going to solidify the future and, and kind of push off a potential cash off commit like we, we kind of skated, you know, skated by over the summer. So. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Looks forward to seeing you in about two weeks.